To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles by opposing and them to die. To sleep no more. And by sleep to say we and the heartache and a thousand natural shocks that flashes out to. It is a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die. To sleep. To sleep a chance to dream either is the rob, for in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There is the respect that makes calamity of so long life, for who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of this pious love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patience merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might as quite as make where the bear Botkin, who would far dolls bear, to sweat and grunt under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns, puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we know, than travel to others we know not of, thus conscious doth make cowards of us all, and thus the native view of resolution is sickly over with a pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Hamlet's soliloquy, to be or not to be, is an eloquent suicidal ideation where Hamlet goes through an internal turmoil that sublimates his dismay. The soliloquy elevates three distinct faces in the ideation and that contribute to its circularity and that we will certainly be examining in this video. Prior to the main event that sets everything in motion in the play, King Hamlet's murder by his conniving brother, Prince Hamlet has been leading a comfortable life. He has never experienced any significant evil. He is a prince and has been living a princely life. Then all abruptly he is snatched from the cushioned reality he has been living in. Hamlet's gigantic ordeal opens his eyes to a reality from which he has been shielded his entire life. The distribution of evil is arbitrary. There is no cosmic imbalance that rewards people for the good they do and punishes them when they deserve punishment. Hamlet has been a kind-hearted prince, a stalwart friend, a loyal lover and a dutiful son. And because of all that, Hamlet has been thinking he was rewarded by living comfortably, protected against any cosmic punishment, until poisonous arrows of outrageous fortune pierce his protective bubble and tear his unsuspecting flesh. This idea of being the recipient of evil without doing anything to deserve it is first expressed by Hamlet in the line, The slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Yes, there is no cosmic balance. Fortune doesn't care whether you deserve to suffer or not. You can lead the most righteous of lives and be at the receiving end of pain that fortune throws at you. Hamlet's monologue captures three vital moments that perpetuate the circularity of the human condition. The first moment is when Hamlet, or anybody who's been led to believe otherwise, understands that they are not playing a fair game. Fate or fortune does not abide by causation. There is nothing one can do to ward off evil or pain. Killing oneself is the only genuine control over the end of suffering, at least in this world. There are many metaphors that foreground the central idea that humans have no control over the pain that they must experience. There is fortune which is personified, given human attributes, and it shoots its arrows at unsuspecting subjects. Another metaphor that Hamlet uses to insist on the randomness of evil is the thousand natural shocks that flashes out to. Natural shocks or natural phenomena send us to the idea of natural evil, evil that is not committed by the hands of men. The meaning of natural in the Merriam-Webster dictionary is existing in nature and not made or caused by people. Being heir to something refers to genetic hereditary, something inescapable that no matter what one does, one never evades. This is a terrifying prospect. It means we have no control over the pain that we endure. The second point that the soliloquy focuses on is the only thing a human can do to shun all the suffering that fortune whimsically hands out, and it is to die, to sleep. At this phase of Hamlet's cogitation, he lays down a number of metaphors that show how appeasing death is. 
Hamlet knows that his rebellion against religion, suicide is a major sin in Christianity, but Hamlet in this portion of the soliloquy embraces his defiance of religion. He says that death is a consummation devoutly to be wished. He turns fate's jargon against it. Devout and devoutly belong to the lexical field of faith and religion, yet Hamlet is saying that it is suicide that is a fate devoutly to be wished. And just as this potent surge of emotions reaches its apotheosis, it is halted by another human emotion fear. The statement that extinguishes the flame of revolt is but that the dread of something after death. Hamlet doesn't believe death is final. The hereafter is another phase that starts after death and this hereafter is unknown and through this small window fear dilutes Hamlet's previous resolution. Little by little fear of the unknown erodes the mountain of determination that we've seen built. This fear of what happens after death is a vestige from Hamlet's old life from before King Hamlet's death at the hands of Claudius. This shows how all Hamlet's rage is not enough to extricate him from the life that he's been living and the constructed truths that he's been absorbing. The final third of the soliloquy is the shortest and also the most terrifying. It is the moment when Hamlet's existential roar is finally silenced. He gives in. He abandons the thought of ending his life. He's weakened. He succumbs to fear. His decision not to act foreshadows how he will fare every time he endures mutilation by good old outrageous fortune. He is bound to go through those stages that start with revolt and that end in submission. It is not Hamlet's fate alone. It is the cycle we all go through whenever we experience the oppressor's wrong, the insolence of office, the pangs of despised love and the proud man's contumely. Before the end of this video, let me point to a fascinating two-way road that Shakespeare lays before our eyes. To show how distressed Hamlet is, Shakespeare evokes distress in situations that happen to regular people in everyday life and people are invited to contrast those situations with Hamlet's ordeal which is much worse than these situations. But then there is another message that sneaks its way to the hearts of the readers or the viewers of the play. Hamlet is a prince and despite his princehood he is subjected to massive evil. What does that say about the rest of people amongst whom only few are princes? We're in for one hell of a ride. Now this video has reached its end. Until we meet again, have a great day.